what does it look like? Say I come in and I'm like, Drew, I don't know what I'm doing with money and I, I want to make sure that I have some later. Where do we start having that conversation? I know it's going to matter. It's probably going to make a difference who's coming in and what the situation <laughs> is. you got to find out what that is. But what are the key things that you want to find out? And, and how does that fall into a strategy as far as, as um, how to start it to, to, to help to build that strategy? your clients absolutely yeah no, it's, a, it's a good question um and, and it actually reflects on the number one most important lesson i've learned in the six years i've been in this business um i had my six year i guess anniversary of getting my licenses a couple of months ago or a couple weeks ago thanks yeah i just popped up in my time hop app so that's the my new <laughs> funny story i'll tell you later but anyways um the biggest thing that I've learned is it doesn't matter how much money someone has that walks through that door. It, what matters is, do they believe what I believe? And it's not that they're wrong or I'm wrong or they're right or that I'm right. But if we don't believe the same things, it's the relationship isn't going to work. Sure. We're going to battle each other the whole way. Um, so at the beginning of every conversation, people, I've had people walk in with packets, lay them on my desk and say, here's my insurance, here's my investments, what should I do? Um, and I always stop them and I say, you know, I appreciate that you're this prepared because many people aren't, mm -hmm. but what the first and most important thing is we need to decide is, do we believe the same things? So, so are we even compatible to work together? Because so at the, at the end of the first conversation, Tate, we're going to find one of three things. One, you're a great guy. I'm hopefully a decent guy, but we don't believe the same things and that's okay. There's someone else in this, I can introduce you to someone else that you should maybe work with, or there's, there's other people in this town that maybe you should work with, and that's okay, let's hopefully be friends. Um, two, we believe the same things, but maybe now's not the right time, and that's okay too, let's stay in contact and schedule a follow-up conversation. And those are, there's a plethora of reasons why it, maybe it's not the right time, life happens, COVID happens, right? So, things like that. So, or three, we find that we believe the same things, great, let's have the conversation and we'll have one, we'll schedule a follow-up one if it makes sense. So that's really the beginning of all conversations. And then it's figuring out, do we believe the same things? All right. So I know we were trying to figure out lighting and how this is all going to work. So a little back background for anyone wondering, my area of expertise is not technology. All right. My number one belief in life, that's not true, but I say it the most. The smarter the technology, the dumber the problems. But, so I'm gonna give you a little introduction as to how I determine if I believe, or if, if people who walk into my office believe what I believe. And if you don't, that's okay, all right? So I, you've never, I've never asked these questions, right? Never. All right, so if, if I'm gonna draw this circle, all right? And what this circle represents, Kate, you're young, right? You're young and healthy, and you have a long life ahead of you. Thanks. Oh, it's not really a circle, it's more of an egg. But hey, I'm not Mr. Furlan, I, I can't draw perfect circles. <laughs> um, if this circle represents all of the wealth that you're one day going to retire with, all right? And it's hard to imagine because we're young, but just all the wealth you're going to want to retire with, whether it's your retirement accounts, your house, your land, your, your animals, right? I'm kidding about the animals, but <laughs> everything that you could one day sell to live off of fits in this circle. And I'm going to call it a retirement pie because it makes the analogy easier, all right? If I drew the first line into your retirement pie right there, all right, I made the first slice. Then I asked you, Tate, take the marker, and will you please draw the second slice into your retirement pie that signifies the amount of your retirement wealth you want to share with the IRS? Where would you draw that slice? Hmm. Well, I guess maybe like right around there-ish. So that's how much you want to share. That's a good point. Maybe, maybe we'll just stay right on that line. All right. So, so if I if I if I, if I read you correctly, as little as possible, you smallest, wrote you wrote what you thought. Piece possible. Okay, the smallest piece possible. So we'll just put a star down here to signify that. And why? And why is that? Why do you want to share as little of your money as possible with the IRS in retirement? Because I want to have as much as I, I want to I want to keep it for for what I want to do with my retirement. And I don't necessarily think that giving it to them is going to help me out that much. Okay, so you want to keep control of your money and not have other people tell you what to do with it. Is that yeah, what you just said? Yeah, that sounds good. 
All right, so be, I appreciate that. Um, because of traditional planning strategies, the average person retiring today ends up having to give up 30 to 40% of their retirement wealth to the IRS. <laughs> Ish. So when you think about that, so you just imagine everything you have today and you fast forward however many years till you retire. Imagine waking up the day after you retire and realizing 30 to 40% of what you thought you had isn't actually yours. I wouldn't be very happy about that, Drew. Be a little upsetting? I'd be a little disgruntled. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Me too, right? So when you think about the fact, and I'm not going to pull out a bunch of stuff, but when you think about the fact that we're, we're currently like almost $26 trillion in debt, our debt's only getting higher. We're at one of the lowest tax rates in the history of our country since like 1920. Do you think it's more likely the IRS, if they get their choice, increase or dec or sorry, decrease or increase the amount of your wealth they want to take? I think they'll probably want to take as much as they can. So you think they're going to try to increase it? I would guess so. So you just told me 30 to 40% you'd be disgruntled. What if you found out it's more like 60%? How would that make you feel? I would maybe even get agitated. <laughs> I don't know where in Tate's <laughs> levels of anger disgruntled and agitated are, but it sounds bad. All right? So what my goal is, so, so we believe, it sounds like we agree. So what my goal is with working with my clients is, is to help them get, as, get this bar as close to the zero line as possible, or at least where they told me, right? We may not ever be perfect because I don't know where you currently have your money, but the point is, is, that's my goal. My goal is to get you from there to there. How does that sound to you? That sounds great. All right, so that's step one of us being on the same page, okay. right? Step two, I'm to, my drawings are phenomenal, I know, but if anyone, I wonder if people can even read this, but hey, that's okay. Oh yeah, I think they get. So the point, so, my, so the second part is, and <laughs> anyone, uh, I'd be interested to see people who worked with me over the years, how much this is adjusted or if it's the exact same, but, um, my second analogy is a retirement mountain. All right, so it looks like a witch's hat, but what it actually is, is Mount Everest. All right, so this is our retirement mountain. All right, if you and I were crazy enough to actually be down here packing up and getting prepared to climb Mount Everest, granted I'm not in close enough, good enough shape, maybe you are, but if you and I were crazy enough to try, what do you think our goal would be? Not only to make it to the top, but to get back down. Good, I like that answer. <laughs> To get to the top, plant our flag, and get back down, right? Climb up and enjoy the trip. So the funny thing about that is a lot of people that I ask that question, they say get to the top. You didn't say that, so I'm not going to go down that tirade, but the interesting thing about it is the retirement mountain reflects perfectly to our financial lives. And what I mean by that is the retirement, on the upside of a mountain, we have the ascension, right? We have to, we have to climb up it top of the mountain, and then we have the descent. And did you know that the majority of people who pass away on Mount Everest pass away on the way down, not the way up? Hmm. I did not know that. So I'm not a professional mountain climber, as you can tell, but I don't, so I don't know exactly why, but my assumption is that they run of, they run of resources, they run of, they had poor planning because the planning up is different than the planning down, things like that, right? And that's the key is the planning up is different than the planning down. When you relate this to our financial lives, we have we'll say four stages. We have our accumulation stage, accumulation. We have our retirement, which can we agree retirement looks differently for everyone. For some people, they want to completely retire. For some people, they just want the choice to retire. Some people, they just want to, to slow down. And everyone's retirement goals are different. Can we agree on that? Yeah. So it's just conceptual. On the way down the mountain, we have our distribution phase. This is where we now have to, on the way up, we accumulate our wealth, right? We work really hard to create income to support our lifestyles today and hopefully set aside enough money to accumulate wealth for the future so we don't have to work forever. And then, in and then we retire or, or get close to it, and then we have to use the money we've accumulated, and we have to distribute it to create income. Do you agree? Yep. And the last phase that we talk about at times is what I call legacy. So I know my handwriting is god awful there, but hey, we'll get over it. So that says legacy, even though it looks like gibberish from a third grader. Actually, third graders might have better handwriting than me. I don't know. They work on a lot more. Probably. probably. Um, the last stage is legacy. 
And that's where you have to ask yourself, is it important to you to leave money to your loved ones once you're gone? And if the answer is yes, we have to have a strategy for that. It doesn't yeah. just happen. Mm -hmm. and if the answer is yes, we have to have a strategy that understands how tax, taxes work, estate taxes work, how wills work, right? So I don't do wills and estate planning, but they're so important. I encourage everyone who walks in through my door to do it. Because I, I think we've all seen what happens to family when money gets involved. It's not, it's not pretty a lot of the time. All right, so going back to the story. So when you look at a financial planning industry, when you think about almost all the commercials you've ever seen, all the conversations you ever hear, all the marketing that's ever done, it's, all, it's almost always on accumulation, 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 rate of return, rate of return, rate of return. What's the stock market doing today? Right, it's almost always on that, right? And you even see commercials where it's like, you start here and you get to the mountain and you won. Congratulations, you've won. But what did you tell me about my Everest? It's not about just getting to the top. You gotta get back down. You gotta get back down and hopefully enjoy the trip, right? You can't stay there. <laughs> right, and, that, and, be, and because of this style of planning is why so many people five, six, seven years into retirement have to completely readjust or go back to work because they never had a strategy to get down. Right. And going back to my 401k example, it's all about accumulating wealth they're not actually teaching you how to spend in retirement. That's why I hate that it's called a plan. It's a yeah. tool, okay? So my point is, do you know why almost all the conversations are on this side of the mountain? Because that's what most people are focused on doing when they come to talk to you, probably? Yes, but it's marketing. Because this is okay. where financial professionals get paid. Sure. Right, you use your 401k advisor, you use me even, you use uh, your investment advisor, I won't okay. drop names. They get paid as you put money in and as, sure. the, as they maintain your assets. When you start distributing your assets, their income goes down. Sure. So does it make sense? Why do they market that side, not that side? Yeah. Right? And that's the dream, too. People are measuring their riches or measuring their wealth by money. And you say, this is how you get all that money. You see why that would be a powerful marketing message. Exactly. Tooling. Exactly. It's a sexy conversation, right? For sure. What we have to ask ourselves is, all right, so you're a business owner, so the conversation's a little bit different, right? So your business name is, I always might have said, CrossFit Great North. Grass, I was going to say Great North CrossFit. Everybody CrossFit knows. Great North, right? <laughs> so in your opinion, what's more important? How much money CrossFit Great North says it's worth or how much it pays you and your family? How much it pays me and my family. And why is that? Well, because there's a, when you talk about business, there's a lot of, things coming in and out and just because you have that top end revenue if, if your expenses come right up there you don't really have anything left so it's what you get to take home that really matters right and what you can spend is what you live off of right yeah so to put that in numbers if you had a choice between plan a that was going to that said you'd have seven million dollars at the top of the mountain and plan b that said you'd have three million dollars at the top of the mountain which one would you choose just off that information, I'd want $7 million at the top of the mountain. Exactly. With no further context, obviously you want plan A. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem is if the story stops there, that's all we're thinking about is how do we get as much money accumulated as fast as possible for retirement? Sure. But if we finish that story and we say, okay, the $7 million is going to pay you $210,000 per year of taxable, taxable income. And the three million is going to pay you. These are all hypothetical numbers, just so we're clear. I'm just setting a point. Right? Is going to pay you one hundred and eighty thousand dollars per year of tax-free income. Which one are you going to choose? I'm going to go with uh, tax-free. I'm thinking. And why is that? Because if the tax changes and they take more, um, you're going to wind up with a lot less. So that makes it a much more predictable level and you don't have to accumulate as much. Right. And plus, so you said multiple things there, but one, if you're at a 30% tax rate, that's $70,000. Your net income is 140. Right. If you're at a 60% tax rate, that's $140,000. Your net income is 70. Woohoo. Or, you know, I didn't do the math perfect, but woohoo. Right. I don't think. Anyways, point is, so you said the first thing was more, it's more, right? Net, the cash flow is more. And two, you said, you don't have to accumulate as much. Do you think it's more likely you'll accumulate three million or seven million over your lifetime? Well, I would guess that it's a lot easier to make three million than seven million. 
Right. So the whole point is going back to my question, what's more important, how much money our, our statement says we have or how much we get paid? How much we get to keep. So in your opinion, what is more important for us to focus on maximizing our rate of return or maximizing our rate of distribution? Rate of distribution. So everything I do, I have an understanding that this side of the mountain is important, mm -hmm. but this side of the mountain is more important. Right. What questions or thoughts do you have on that? Makes perfect sense. Do you agree or disagree with that logic? I agree 100%. So to answer your question, this would be the time of the conversation I would say, Tate, it sounds like we believe the same things. Let's continue our conversation and start gathering, gathering more information about you. And that's where I would start asking you more personal questions about what it is you're trying to achieve, where you're trying to go, what your goals are, and things like that that we don't have to outline for our audience. But hopefully that answers the question that you asked. 100%. Uh, that's a very valuable conversation.